market collection, and then I uh, used two of my research projects to try to beef up a bit the, the contents of the kind of question of travel that. In particular, the point here, and it's a, I think it's a particularly salient uh, issue at the moment, is the fact is the relationship between uh, immigration status or legal status and belonging in the context of moving borders as well. So the idea and the case of the European Union and the Brexit is particularly relevant. You have the fact that people are changing status without moving as a particular interest for the kind of question you raise in terms of belonging and sense of belonging. Who are we in inverted commas? It's a question that everyone is uh, from uh, uh, UC Design in UK are, are addressing at the moment, are facing at the moment on a, an everyday basis. As uh, you can see, there is also obviously a biographical element in the presentation, we'll see soon uh, uh, as well. So the, the connection between, um, the connection between uh, immigration status and uh, the way that people constructed their sense of belonging is at the center of this the presentation. What I've tried to do using two samples now as a starting point is to try to look the way that the control over this change of position within the relationship between the person and the state is not necessarily in control of the person for a number of reasons. So uh, this is Daniela Vargas, so she's uh, 22 years old, and um, a few months ago she, ended up, she was arrested by the immigration police in the US. Uh, it, this is uh, one of our lawyers saying, it's like a roll of the dice. It's the officer who picks up, uh, uh, picks you up along with others, the family members, thinks, you are okay, kids, you are going to let you go. Maybe you're okay. But if somebody sees it in a different way, you could be subject to enforcement and deportation. What is interesting of this case is that Daniela Vargas was one of the so-called documented irregular undocumented migrants in the US. So the, the young people that were received an amnesty under Barack Obama, or actually more than an amnesty, is the deferral of their deportation formal. So it's not a legal status, but it's a suspension of the deportation order, which enabled people to, for two years, to have the right to work, the right to pursue education, etc., etc. What happens uh, since the election of Trump is that there is a lovely database with information on all this uh, over 700,000 documented young people. And some of them have been picked up by the police. So in a sense, you have the same data can be used in one way or the other. Mm -hmm. The point here is from being documented, which is partially regularized, she became a deportee. And then the lawyer managed to stop that. But it's quite an interesting transition. Yeah. Second example is, uh, is an extract from my um, online diary, uh, which is called Legal Remain, Diary of a New Citizen UK. And this is what I wrote on the 24th of June at about 5 in the morning. Um, yeah, it was a long night, so it actually a bit, <laughs> it's a bit painful. Uh, unreal, extraordinary, indecent. This is according to Nigel Farage, who proclaims the referendum a victory of the real, ordinary, and decent people, what I am. This is three million of us, you nationals, that we are not even allowed to vote, whose voices have been silenced throughout the referendum campaign. It is about 14 million Brits who voted the Remain. It feels like a scar, like a glass falling on the floor and breaking in tiny little pieces, like a spit in the face, like a personal earthquake, something shaking your inner core, who you think you were. And, uh, and this is quite interesting in transition. I had a um, number of friends who are uh, non EU nationals that they start to say, stop mourning. Uh, you know, this is something we have been going through forever, and now you complain, you privileged uh, European, which is, a, is an interesting point. But the point is, I think, is, is to, to understand that the reaction, there is also something else. It's the idea that um, for the EU nationals in Britain, basically, they were very much embodying the, the European project by being in Britain. I was a European citizen in the UK. I was never been a migrant. Actually, I became a migrant in the recent uh, in the election campaign. And this is quite an interesting way of putting it. This is a, a quotation from a former EU Commissioner for Education. In talking about the Erasmus program, um, she's saying, we are creating a community which diversity is not a problem, but a characteristic. It's an integ integral part of feeling European. So intra-EU mobility, the fact that an Italian lives in Britain is actually being European itself. So the change of the context, the change of the, of the, of the, the the perspective of exit, I mean, now we need to use conditional because we don't know what's going to happen, but <laughs> <laughs> this is not. 
Uh, it, it really marked the transition from EU citizen into EU migrant. This is actually, you can map it in the public discourse before the election and the, the referendum. And from EU migrants into migrants itself. So it's a change of label that also marked a, a, a sort of a change in the position within society. And the point here is that massive repercussion in the terms of how these three million people felt about being in. So that the relationship here is between the politics of belonging, uh, to use Nira Yuvalder's terms, with the, the sense of belonging. So how this, uh, the repercussion of the change of context on the way that people construct themselves. So this is what I'm gonna try to, to unpack in the presentation. Uh, it seems to me that the overall context can be marked by two um, interlinked phenomena. On one end, the precarization, and on the other end, the proliferation of immigration status for non-citizens. This is something that you has been uh, developed by uh, for example, Roger Zetter were talking about refugees, but also uh, Goldring and Lando talking about their position, the precariousness as, as part of the existential position of uh, undocumented and uh, precariously documented people in, in the context of Canada. But what this sort of precarious of status and this uh, multiplication of legal status produce is also a kind of what we call figures of membership in society. The fact that you can no longer just oppose the citizen and non-citizen as a binary, but you can position people along a spectrum in terms of the way that they relate to, to the state. <coughs> and what I'm trying to do is that we, what we don't know, though, is the way in which these immigration statuses, which are precarious and fragile, intersect with other social privileges like age, class, gender, race, and country of origin, for example. And also, I think, at the way that the precarization of legal status for non-citizen is also been uh, producing effects of reality on the citizen and society. So these are the kind of key question, big question that the work I've been doing for a few years now is try to address and I uh, will continue to work on. And one way of understanding theoretically, conceptually, this, this uh, state of fair is to think about the fact that we, uh, the, the fact that the regime of rights or the set of rights and entitlement people has no longer come straight or directly from the state, but there are different sources of rights. And you can look at this, for example, in terms of globally, nationally, or locally, in terms of scale, but also in terms of the formal legitimation. If you can link up, for example, with the use sanguinis, you solely use domicile. The same, for example, the idea, for example, uh, that uh, currents, Joe currents, developed of the uh, people um, uh, creating an entitlement for claiming rights on the basis of having spent a large chunk of their life in a place. So you stand here 10 years in a sense, you create almost a, an entitlement, a sense of deservingness for a recognition. So that would be the, the use, the idea of use domicilia, I'm using here. I Ong also pointed out in particular that rights and entitlement once associated with citizens are becoming dispersed among populations that can include also non-citizens in different ways. So this idea of so going beyond the binary and this is part of the beyond in the title, so within and beyond citizenship is the idea of really marking uh, this border as much less, much more fluid than we assume. But there is actually an interesting question now for future research, in a sense, to understand this neonativism that we see, for example, in the US with Trump, or, or elsewhere, for example, the, the transformation of uh, the politics of belonging following the, the referendum votes is changing this. So to understand this uh, state of affairs is very much linked to a liberal democracy kind of uh, concept of legal framework. And it can be lost in case that we stand to go back to a much more state-based uh, model of relationship between individual and, and institution. What is important though is also not look at this also all, all in terms of <coughs> re regime of rights and, and, <coughs> and forms of legitimation, but also to think of why is this is the case. In many ways you've seen very clearly, for example, in the last few months, uh, the extent to which that the, the, the human rights, uh, the human rights fr framework or order has been put under question. So the extent to which, in a sense, there has been a very clear, much more explicit than in the past, a link between the neoliberal globalization and the, uh, the globalization of the human rights framework there. And it's something that you can see in the attacks that you have from, for example, Theresa May, but also Trump, how the two things are all put together. It's quite interesting how they, they have been brought together in more clear ways than be, before was, uh, uh, we tend to, to think. And this is why it's also important to think about, again, the political economy, economy of this precarity, or the, and the idea, for example, of Saskia Sands, and to see how the transformation of the global economy is also producing a no, new nodes in the, in the 
uh, new nodes where instances of right make uh, claiming can be articulated. So the role of the global the global cities, for example, and the fact that you have the processes of rescaling in terms of the significance of the uh, uh, of the relationship between the person and the, the, the country where they are located. The point here, though, is not to assume these processes as um, uh, monodirectional and not, and not assume them as, as uh, uh, fixed. So they are talking of a situation which is extremely dynamic and things can change very rapidly, as well as uh, we, are, we are finding out on an everyday basis. Uh, uh, almost every time you check your Twitter account, uh, what's going on. Um, okay. Another part of this um, sort of uh, key element of this idea of this conceptualization of the of membership is linked to the understanding of what do we mean by citizenship itself and the idea of shifting or emphasizing not just a, a kind of state-centric understanding of citizenship and membership, but or taking uh, into account <coughs> the, the, the work that for the Manganese and, and colleagues have done, focusing on the becoming a citizen, so the performative, uh, the performative part of citizenship, the idea that the claim of right as a great part of the process of becoming a, a citizen. And this is also linked to debates in the US, particularly the role of uh, Linda Bosniak, uh, exploring the fact that uh, while, for example, especially among the migrant, migration scholars and migration activists, citizenship is seen as a panacea of every problem, so once you get citizenship, you solve your problem. And on the other end, what you see from, uh, especially in race and ethnic studies, the fact that they're very well aware that if you happen not to be white and male, the fact you are a citizen doesn't mean that you are, you are equal to what the other people in your society. So in a sense, the point here is to look at citizenship both has uh, drawing a line of exclusion towards the outside, the citizen and non-citizen, but also having several lines of exclusion inside. And, and how we can reconcile this vision is also quite challenging, theoretically, and in practice. Now, I'll, uh, what I've tried to do, I'll look at two uh, projects I've been working on. I'm trying to explore this idea of intersectionality in terms of understanding the impact of legal status, of precarious legal status, and also the significance of the space and spatiality in understanding this experience of belonging. The first project that I'm going to uh, look at is a project that's um, uh, related to the condition of undocumented young people and children in Britain. The second one is more linked to research I've been carrying out about uh, Roma stateless people in Italy. Uh, relation to, we're talking about illegality regimes and the experience of paperless, uh, paper, paperless life. By illegality regime, uh, I want basically very loosely indicate an assemblage of laws, policy, and practice that produce a di discipline, unwanted human mobility, and illegalized migrants. So this. Um, so the, and th this work started on the idea that uh, uh, trying to understand what is the position within the current society of so-called illegal migrants, illegal migrants, or undocumented migrants, without, you know, migrants you can use it without the comments there. And in particular, I was looking at the way that this mobility of people that uh, job can define as unwanted and try to understand the rule is really, uh, has got, uh, is dressed in three countries, in particular the US, the UK, and, and Italy here. So in the first column you have Barack Obama on the 15th of June, five years ago exactly today, um, uh, talking about the DACA uh, uh, regularization I mentioned before. And he's trying to explain the rationale for uh, that uh, decision, that executive order. These are young people who study in our school, they play in our neighborhoods, they are friends with our kids, they pledge allegiance to our flag, they are Americans in their art, in their minds, in every single way but one, on paper. More or less at the same time, we have, uh, um, and, and basically this was the justification for uh, the introduction of the Deferred Action on Childhood arrival, uh, Arrivals. The second one is from uh, the then uh, British Prime Minister David Cameron, and he basically said, I want everyone in this country to help reclaim our borders, and as a result of this, he was inviting people, uh, he, he created what is called a National Allegation Database, and invited people to submit online allegations about people that seem to be regular migrants. So he said, you will go online and report people that you think are irregular migrants. Obviously, it would be very much interesting to do an analysis of this report and see who gets reported or not. I, I um, 
maybe a bit cynically assume that there are not many US or Canadian whites and not many migrants or republics. That's that just me being cynical. <laughs> and the other result of this kind of approach was very much uh, the, go the famous go home uh, van campaign. Again, very interesting. The campaign was run mostly in uh, uh, South and East London, Brixton, and uh, New America, which everyone knows are uh, sort of areas of very high uh, ethnic diversity with very large black populations. So it's kind of interesting also. The place where you direct your campaign tells a lot of, about your assumption about who is the regular migrants. <laughs> the third one is uh, uh, this is. Uh, Lampedusa, October 2013, and it's uh, probably the, fair, the beginning of the so-called European refugee crisis, in a sense, it's the European existential crisis, and, uh, and this was very much linked to the idea that Italy was, uh, at the time, criminalized undocumented migration crew. So basically the point was that uh, entering irregularly into Italy became a crime and was uh, criminalized. Mm -hmm. However, what is interesting of these three stories is also that um, First, Barack Obama was also the president that had uh, devoted the largest number of undocumented migrants to date. So while on one hand had that kind of narrative and discourse, was at the same time implementing a significant number of undocumented uh, of, uh, deportation and forced removal. Um, within the context of the UK, you have the case resolution problem, which was basically <coughs> almost an ongoing regularization amnesty. So people who had applied for asylum in whose case had taken long and had children, <coughs> and that regularized uh, tens of thousands of people. And in the third case, while in Italy you have the criminalization of uh, the irregular entries in the country, on the, on the other end, you have uh, a country which uh, does regularization on documented migrants on a regular basis first. And the second one was the country that launched the, the Mare Nostrum operation that saved that over 100,000 people from the sea in the same year. So this sort of contrast between what actually happened in terms of practice and British and the discourse is something quite striking that we observe. The way we understood this, the understanding of the illegal is very much based on the work that Nicolas de Genova has been doing about around the social legal production of illegality uh, and the idea of illegality regime, but also the work of Sarah William around what is she called the, the, uh, phenomenolo the critical phenomenology of illegality, the idea that it's possible to read through the engagement with the people that are irregularized what are the factors that shape that the, the, the illegality in the country. So the idea of how the forms of illegality are constructed that can be read also through the experience of the people on the ground. So, and one of the key characteristics of, uh, of, uh, of this condition of being undocumented, particularly through the work of the Genova, is the idea of deportability and the fear of deportation as something shaping the existential experience of the undocumented uh, uh, person. Roberto Gonzalez, uh, uh, that is also the co-editor of, of the book that's coming out in uh, two weeks' time, uh, talks of uh, in, uh, the immigration status as a master <coughs> status when he's trying to explain the position of the young, many young people within the context of the US in particular. So as I say, the deportability, so the fear of deportation becomes a way of understanding the experience of uh, undocumented migrants. However, the, the risk here, and I guess it's been something we pointed out also in the, in, the, in the book published in 2014, is that we produce a kind of a monodimensional uh, idea of what being undocumented is, and on the other hand, we also close space for a chain agency of the undocumented person. The idea that not everyone fears deportation in the same way is in the same way, it's actually an important starting point. The very example I said before, that while there may be uh, thousands of Australian uh, citizens, white citizens that have overstayed their visa that are undocumented in the UK. If you look at the statistic on, uh, on forced removal, you won't, almost don't see them. Uh, and they are probably right not to fear too much of being uh, captured by the UK border police. Um, and here are, are uh, some examples for the research that was I carried out with uh, Alice Block from University of Manchester and Roger Zetter, University of Oxford. Why should I fear to go back home, said Uriana, a 28 years old uh, Ukrainian uh, migrant in, in London. Uh, it's quite interesting, I mean, very simply, why I should fear to be sent back home? When we asked about, do you fear deportation? That was the question. Uh, and it's quite interesting because if you look, and this was the exact opposite answer that we received from the Kurdish regular migrant that we interviewed, which were actually very much fearing the, the risk of being deported, was very much part of the everyday um, uh, 
experience of how they were moving in the city, what it was, how they were, the place where they were going, and the decision they were taking. But it's also quite interesting how, for example, if we, when we looked at, uh, at the case of uh, the Brazilians, what, so there was a strange contrast between white Brazilians and black Brazilians in their fear of, the, of uh, being deported. We had a lot of uh, um, white Brazilians who were working, for example, in pubs and bars mm -hmm. and, uh, and cafes, uh, 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 very, and going out, basically spending all the weekend out and uh, talking over life to be in London, and it was brilliant and uh, exciting. And on the other hand, we had uh, some of the, uh, the interviewees who were black Brazilians that were pointing out the fact that, for example, the weekend, they were always, always taking a taxi, even if it was just a few hundred meters they had to do, because they were much more visible on the street, so they, were, they, be, they became much more streetwise, so that was what was pointed out. And, and about also the fears and the, the motivation of the understanding of fears. So there is both, obviously, as I was about to at the beginning, this idea of the intersection with race, with your country of origin, and the reason why you migrated are very important to understand the fear. On one hand, contrasting, for example, the, some of the Kurds with the Ukrainian interviewees, but also the fact that the fear is very much shaped also by um, uh, exogenous factors. So, for example, the fact that the Home Office sends the Go Home van in Brixton. Uh, it's, it's basically create a cli climate of fear in that area, but it's also signaling to the black underground migrants that they are the one, the target, rather than the others. So it's, it's quite an important uh, element there. Um, to consider. Another aspect in the research, which was quite interesting, we are bringing back the dimension of age this, in this research was the extent to which that the way we very much asked people why you did it, why you came here uh, knowing oh, if you were undocumented, was it worth it? And the idea of being uh, reclaiming a sense of independence, the idea of not, I, I didn't worry about the consequence because I'm young, this sort of sense of empowerment by, given by the age was very much uh, uh, evident in what we talked, uh, when we talked to people, but also the opposite. So in a sense, when we were talking, with, uh, we were interviewing the people between 18 and 30 for the research. And it was very interesting to see how people who had spent eight, nine years as an undocumented migrant in UK, when they were getting around 28, 29, they started to think about how their position, like life stage, was different now. It was time to move on with life, and so that life as an undocumented migrant was no longer worth it. So we had people that were packed to back, back home, which is quite an interesting, interesting uh, sort of link up with the life stage and the immigration status. The second project is, looks at the experience of stateless, um, uh, stateless people in, in the context of Italy. And sorry for the title there. Is, uh, I want to look at the link between camp status and belonging. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the stateless convention, but this is just a definition of who is a stateless person according to the 1950 World Convention, UN Convention, someone who is not recognized as a nation but any state under the operation of its law. So that's what we the definition. And what we're looking here is about the number of, number of stateless people in the world varies. There is a, a very sort of uh, fluid <coughs> population, but also it's very hard to capture any goals between 8 to 13 million people, according to the UN, uh, UNCR statistics. Um, uh, about six to 700,000 are in Europe, and one of the largest group uh, would be the uh, would be the Roma people, possibly from former Yugoslavia, that migrated as a result of the dissolution of Yugoslavia. So when uh, I, I did work, did work with uh, this uh, Roma from former Yugoslavia in Italy in 2014, um, in 2014, and previously uh, as part of my PhD. What is interesting here is to understand the status of being. Why I'm looking at state lessons? Because state lesson in this spectrum of position within society, when I was talking about membership as a, as a spectrum, and the, 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 uh, in a way, state lesson is the extreme of that spe spectrum. Um, Lindra Kerber and uh, Audrey McLean uh, talks about the, the stateless person as the citizen other, so not the foreigner, because the foreigner, in a way, is a, is a, a citizen somewhere else, but the stateless is. Uh, theoretically, someone who is the opposite of the citizen because it's beyond, I enable you to look at this position to question the very state as a, as a, as a, uh, the state regime itself. Mm -hmm. So, what I was interested to see was well, there is this uh, stateless as almost an impossible position in current liberal democracy. On the other hand, I got 13 million people that live on an everyday basis without any. 
passport ID card or anything. I was a supervisor. And working, I've been working with the Roma for a long time. It was fascinating to see that there are people that have been for 20, 30 years as stateless person in Italy. So in a sense, this is not even talking about a place where in theory there is no rule of law or there is still a liberal democratic state, but in the core of the European Union, how do they manage? And why we don't find a solution? That was the starting point of the discussion. But what I wanted to see was very much, uh, and I was curious to see how these people, families were surviving. So this have an idea of emphasis on the everyday aspect of the statelessness. Uh, and a part of this, of the contest is very much defined by a kind of revival of attention on, uh, on statelessness, which started uh, uh, almost in, in um, coinciding with the 60th anniversary of the 1954 UN Convention on the Status of Stateless Person and the 50th anniversary of the UN Convention on the Reduction of Status. So about uh, uh, five, six years ago, we started to have a number of publication initiatives led by the UNCR, who is responsible by its mandate about the status person around this issue. What is interesting there is that very much the, the position of the status person is understood within the context of the humanitarian regime as mirroring the one of the refugees. So very much the, the convention was developed initially together with the Geneva Convention for the Status of Refugees, then it was taken out, but it still has got the same model of intervention. So someone has to apply to be recognized as a status person, there's a procedure, and then he gets the status, a piece of paper that enables them to travel, and that should enable them also to become citizen quite soon afterwards. So because the countries have uh, an obligation to reduce the lessness, also means that, for example, the children of stateless persons should be entitled automatically to have the citizenship of the country where they're living. So that, that will be the, the idea of the framework. Very much based on the idea of this victim, uh, uh, of a victim model of a passive person that needs to be recognized. The problem is that, is that there are, uh, the causes of statelessness are extremely complex, and in many cases very different from the causes of um, forced displacement or the, uh, the way that people become refugees. So uh, we're going to look at the individual causes or collective causes. Very often, if you look at who are these 13 million status persons in the world, very often we are talking about uh, ethnic or religious minority in specific cases. So there is, and how they became stateless is also important to bear in mind. It's very much rooted in the idea of who is, who belongs. So this is bringing us back about the importance of relating uh, the understanding of the immigration status, the fluidity of the immigration status, but also to the politics of belonging. So when you define who belongs, you also define who don't, doesn't belong. And in this case, who is the stateless? Is in a way something that helps you to understand how political is the question. So how do we address a political question through a humanitarian system is challenging. And it's, uh, it's very interesting to understand what's going on. But this is a sort of another paper. Uh, in the case of uh, the Roma, what was in particular interesting was that obviously the Roma are a, were a minority in the context of Yugoslavia, but they, and they are a minority in the context of Italy. Um, within the context of Yugoslavia, what happened, and this is the research of Julia Serdelic in particular, pointed out that they became the, the, um, the post Yugoslavia subaltern uh, because there was no place for them in the new nation that were born out of the dissolution of the Federation of Yugoslavia. So the Roma within the deck contest moved from uh, a, a, a country which for the first time in Europe and in the world was recognizing them as a minority in their constitution to a place where they was actually not even allowed to register in, as a resident in some places. So there was a movement towards other European states. The problem is that when they get to Italy, they found a different story there. And that story was very much a story of uh, centuries of stigmatization of the gypsies. Uh, and so they, they moved from a stigma to another stigma. As a result of this position, they found some of them, for reasons that are also very bureaucratic mistakes, for example, in the transliteration from civilian <coughs> to black, of their surname, they found that they were basically, they were not um, uh, on the birth registers, so they weren't able to get any documentation, they weren't able to claim a passport. So they basically, it's almost a double stigma that produced the stigmatization of the Roma in that context. And this is already said it. Uh, what I wanted to find out then is how do I understand then the social condition of being stateless? So not the humanitarian condition, but the, the social condition. And I started from the work of Hannah Hand and their idea of the triple loss, the loss of home, of go go government protection. Is not, it's not that they are not equal before the law, she says, but that no laws exist uh, for them. But also, and I was interested for the work I've been doing on camps, 
is the idea that she sees very much the camp, the internment camp, has the place that was created very early on to deal with these people that we didn't know where to put. So she says that an, as early as in the, in the 30s, internment camp was the only country the world had to offer to stateless. What I found out when I went to Italy was that a lot of the stateless Roma were living in spaces which are encampments. They were not having access to houses in many cases. They were living in this uh, um, shanty towns. So I was quite fascinated to see what the shanty town, what their camp was enabling them to do, uh, or to achieve that. This was um, what I tried to do. But before coming into the actual, the actual experience, uh, uh, it's interesting also to, uh, to look at the way that the recognition of statelessness is uh, managed in the context of Italy. And that it's very briefly, and basically Italy uh, has signed both the 1950 war and the 1961 uh, conventions. Uh, there are two, it's one of the few countries that has got process for recognition of statelessness. Uh, and actually, it's got not one process, but two. The first one is a, a, an administrative process, which basically implies you applying it with the, the, um, the Ministry of the Interiors. To, uh, and the second one is a judicial process. Basically, you basically make a claim in front of a judge, and the judge decides on an ad hoc basis. What is interesting with the, the administrative process, which is the main process, is that uh, among the things that you get requested are birth certificates, which you would think that for a, a, someone who is stateless maybe it's sometimes hard to get, not always, but sometimes. Proof of residence, which is also quite hard if you try to go to a laboratory to register and you haven't got any paper to present about your identity to get someone registering you. And also a paper proving that you are stateless. So some of the authorities were requesting people to present letters signed by the, um, the consulates of the Yugoslavian state saying this person is not our citizen. If you push this, uh, this criteria to the extreme, it's quite interesting because basically you should ask to all 195 states of the world to a letter which they say you are not their citizen in order to claim state lesson. <laughs> in this case, they were reducing the data, we just asked you for all the Yugoslavian uh, consulates to issue the problem there. The main problem with this was, as I said, this stigmatization of the, of the Roma in Yugoslavia is, a long, is very present at the moment. So what the lawyers I spoke to when mentioning was the fact that a lot of the consulates were refusing of issuing a paper say, stating that. They didn't even address. So even if you were putting a claim, they were not answering. So you can also say that people may be able to refine the trace, trace their uh, uh, link to, to a country you would like. But probably that the embassy refuse, in a sense, create an obstacle to access to the procedure that from the perspective of the Italian state is basically uh, you are Rather than helping you to get the status, it becomes actually a way to exclude you from that route. Because you are unable to present the letter, you cannot be a stateless person. So the other route, which is the only one is in which the Roma have been successful, is going through a judge. The problem of going through a judge is that there is no actually a, a the process is very ad hoc. It varies according to almost every court in Italy. And there is not a clear idea of how many people are successful because data are not collected and put together. So in a sense, it's a quite an interesting process. And what happened among the people I spoke to, a, a number of lawyers as well, they really pointed out that people that are successful, they are all, you can all trace back a very small number of lawyers that know how to do it. Otherwise, you won't have any chance in a way. So what is I find even more inter interesting here is that the Roma, from uh, Roma, stateless Roma, are so stateless, they cannot have access to the statelessness procedure. Or you could say another way, that are so marginalized within the, the, our understanding of our, the Italian politics of belonging that from, they cannot transit from stateless without inverted comma to stateless with, the, with commas. So from, the, from being a, a stateless person to be a recognized stateless person is impossible to them. So I call them the undeserving the stateless. But then, how do they survive? That was the, uh, before moving towards. And what, what I, there was three areas that I, I tried to explore. One was it, uh, linked to the link between the, the status as a stateless person, the condition as a stateless person, and the, the, the role of the camp. The second one is we want to really much explore uh, the, um, the equivalence between stateless and rightless, which is so central in the way that uh, Anna Rand described the position of the stateless person. The third one is about how they cope within the family unit. So the role of the family is managing to survive, essentially. So what one aspect that came out is was quite interesting that these people had access to some kind of forms of entitlement rights 
we can call them soft rights, in Italian literature they call other soft rights or local rights. So the idea, and very much what, the way they are, traced, they are traced back to the idea of the use domicili. So the fact that this person has spent 20 years here, in a way creates an, almost an obligation to, for local authorities to give them something. What they get given often though is the camps. So it's this encampment where they become a place where people are concentrated and they receive some kind of uh, ad hoc welfare entitlement. The problem with this, um, with this kind of solution is that the, the legal status of this camp varies according to Italian cities. In some cases, they give you some form of piece of paper which says that you are a local resident of this specific city. In other cases, they even put, enable you to register on the um, anagraphic register, so the, the, the register of residents. As I said before, in order to be recognized as a status, or even for applying for a legal status as a migrant, you need to have the, the registration. What is interesting here that is the local rights, there is a, a, a gap, a, a disjunction between the local rights and the state rights. The state rights you can only have access if you get those bureaucratic things in place, says actually. The local right has got a much more flexible, but at the same time is also producing this sort of uh, protected condition of being stateless, and you cannot go out in any, in any way. But the output was also interesting, was that even among those who managed to go through the process, so to be recognized as a stateless person, uh, normally, uh, if you look at it from the perspective of international lawyers, that should be the, the, the first and necessary step towards basically applying for citizenship and sort out your sort of position. What was really interesting with the Roma, or even the one who was successful, was that basically uh, a lot of them, they would get a deportation order afterwards for a stranger. What happened is, you apply for citizenship, <coughs> they issue a temporary, uh, the person of interview, they issue a temporary uh, permit to stay, or a limited, a, um, and the person then takes this fund to travel a bit to also Europe. In some cases, people get uh, picked up because they did some petty crimes. That goes on their criminal record. Uh, France, in this case, sent back them to Italy. Italy immediately issued a deportation order. Now, uh, even if the person, in one case, the person that basically led to the rejection of the stateless application, even if there was not a, a good character criteria. In another case, what was interesting was the person who got the refugee, uh, the stateless, uh, the status as a stateless person recognized, but then because they had the criminal record that they, they got issued a deportation order, which is what they normally do with the, the um, uh, undocumented migrants that, that got picked up. The problem is that having a clean criminal record is also a requirement for applying for citizenship. So you have, on one hand, someone who is a stateless recognized with a deportation order, which obviously cannot be implemented because where do they send you if you are stateless? Well, on the other hand, you are also not allowed to become a citizen. So you are suspended in this limbo, which you become basically a protected position for, the, for a number of Roma that we interviewed. So it was quite an interesting case. And the only way you can survive in that position is through the camp. Because the camp is, has got this element of exceptionality compared to the state, uh, the state legislation, however, is very normal in the context of the local authorities. So this is also, you can sort of develop a critique of the Agamben idea of exceptionality around this, which is, I've done in another, in another work. And, and then, uh, finally, I mean, the, the other dimension which was interesting was the extent to which, and, and this is important when we talk about legal status as a master status, also in the case of Roma, the, the way that uh, the, the uncertainty, the precariousness of the condition of, of legal status, conditional limbo, was very much um, at, um, percolating into the everyday life, in the family decision, in the, in the people that were allowed or not allowed to marry, or the people that were married but they were not allowed to register marriage, which means that if they have kids, the kids basically are outside the, uh, the, the marriage, the outside marriage, and this was having, for example, repercussion in case someone one of them went to prison and was not allowed to have visits from the wife or for the kids because they were not formally recognized as a, as a family. Um, so there was not a huge number of decisions that were affected by the, the legal status. Argentina was a, a 35 years old Romani, uh, Roma woman, uh, and her siblings couldn't marry formally because despite having lived in Italy for about 20 years, they were undocumented and stateless. What is interesting of Roma families was in the same families, you could have people who had Italian citizenship, people who were stateless, people who were undocumented, and someone who was a refugee. So you got both in terms, if you look at Roma families as, a, as an enlarged family, there is this variation of status, and now people were negotiating within the family unit, the decision was fascinating. 
But also you have a more interesting and link up to the, the way that Italy managed uh, migration. You have people that move across from one status to another over a period of time. So in a sense, a lot of uh, even the regular Roma will tell you that for a number of years they were undocumented, or they were, became undocumented for six months. So being undocumented or being precarious is almost a normal part of the life of, of some migrants in, in the context of Italy, which also explains why people cope with it, because they know that if they wait enough, they will get you know, used to this illegal kind of social of that. And she said, my sister, she was in a brief relationship with an Italian guy. They had a baby girl. When they split, the girl went with the in-laws uh, because she didn't have uh, any ID paper, and now she was trying to get the ID paper as a way of then claim back the maternity of the, of the kid. Of the girl. So it's this sort of uh, everyday experience that, that we're emerging from, from the research. So to, just to conclude, uh, I think what I would like to do is, 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 to, is, is an invitation to move beyond the citizenship, non-citizenship kind of uh, sharp distinction, the binary, and, and acknowledge the plurality of everyday experience of membership, but also the fluidity of this experience of membership, the way that the, the contours of membership are continuously retros, often with, for reasons that are very not necessarily closely linked to the experience of the individual. So in a sense, the world can change around you, even if you haven't done nothing particular to, 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 to do it. But also to understand these experiences uh, and the relationship between these people, the person and the state as, a, as both embodied and, it, as I said before, for them, if you are young and undocumented, or if you are an old and undocumented, it's extremely different. If you are a parent or with kids or without, it makes it different in the way that the status affects you. Um, in many cases, if you, are, if you are a woman and you want to have the chance, for example, to apply for a, uh, uh, for a regularization, you are, it may be more difficult for you to, put, to be able to present a, 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 contract, a job contract, because this is how it is. It's much more difficult to have access to, job, uh, to work. And so they affect you in your chance of regularization. So we need to understand the positionality. But also, I think, the situatedness, so that the, the, the placing legal status in, in specific place, both in terms of thinking about the city, and I'm thinking, for example, at the global city as uh, Saskia Sass uh, work. And if you think that there's a famous image, there's 100,000 undocumented migrants marching in Chicago, visibly in the main squares, and becoming visible while still being undocumented. But also as the camp is a place where some forms of legal precarity become uh, livable. In a sense. So the idea of situated status is, I think, is a really important one. And also the idea of, of consa consider the fragility of the nature of citizenship and non-citizenship alike, as a detention, uh, as they are produced as a result of the new liberal globalization on one end, but also the revival of nationalism and, and protectionist economic views at the moment. More specifically, and this is, I, I conclude, um, I think it's important also to think of the distance between the lived experience and the certified status. And the position of the stateless was particularly striking in this sense. Uh, and the intersection between immigration status as a master status with the other dimension. In the case of the old stateless, and in particular, it was really important, I think, to reflect on the fact that there is, uh, uh, the, we, we don't have a zero sum model which you are a citizen or a citizen. And if you look from the perspective that live in our society, there is much more, sort of, the equation doesn't, doesn't work. In many ways, uh, and the status person are ra neither rightless or agencyless because they manage to negotiate the space within the camp, but they also they manage to claim locally some 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 some, some rights, but from a position which is very much structured and limited by the, the opportunities that are available uh, to them. Thank you. Thank you.